Hello there. Do you mind if I just rant for a minute? You ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? So it's this idea that um, people who are brand new to something have an excessive amount of confidence about their abilities. And the more experienced you get and the more knowledge you gain, the more humility you have. And it looks like this. So initially, as you learn a little bit, your confidence skyrockets. And then as you learn a little more, you realize you really don't know that much. Then once you get to the level of an expert, there's this huge confidence gap between where you were when you were ignorant and where you are now as an expert. Because here's the thing, the more you learn, the more you realize that there's a lot that you don't know. And it's hard not to see the gaps in your understanding when you get to that point. And it's very easy to forget what you do know. In fact, I'll frequently have this moment with my students that's kind of silly. But they'll ask a question and I'm like, whoa, I know the answer to that. I know a crap ton of stuff because I, I forget what I know because I'm always facing what I don't know. So this um, Dunning-Kruger effect has been on my mind recently. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a story that happened a couple years ago that uh, really illustrates this. So at the university that I currently work at, the online courses are eligible for redevelopment every three years. And the online stats curriculum was due for development. And intro stats is like my thing. That's like my area of expertise is teaching statistics. And I got my PhD in quantitative psychology and I was in a psychology department developing the quantitative psychology class. And so I was trying to get my own department to adapt my curriculum. But there was a problem. The woman who had developed it a few years prior also wanted to redevelop the curriculum. But her idea of redevelopment meant making small changes, whereas I wanted to do radical changes. So we began to talk about the merits of me doing it versus her doing it. And what I argued is that she's a generalist. She got like a, she got a PhD, but it was in like neuroscience or something. And now she teaches stats. And I was arguing, hey, I am the resident stats expert. If you have a resident stats expert, shouldn't they be the one to develop the curriculum? Especially if that expert is both willing and able. And she was so offended that I had said, that I was an expert and she wasn't. And she says, I've been teaching intro stats for 10 years. How dare you say I'm not an expert? And what I really wanted to do was pull out this graph and say, hey, you are right here. That wouldn't have been very diplomatic, but it would have been true because there is a big difference between those who regularly teach intro stats based on a curriculum that is 70 years old and is super dated and somebody like me. I got my PhD in this stuff. And as part of my advanced degree, I had to take like 15 stats courses. That's a far cry from the standard like one or two that most graduate students have to take in any other program. Not only do I regularly study the literature, but I publish in the literature regularly on stats, on the teaching of statistics. And what I really wanted to say to her was, hey, do you have any idea how to compute the derivative with respect to an eigenvalue? I didn't think so. Technically, neither do I. Math stat isn't my thing, but you get the idea. So having that sort of expertise is very, very, very different from regularly teaching intro stats courses. So that, that's, and that's what really frustrates me actually. Like saying you are an expert in stats because you teach intro stats is like saying you are an expert guitarist because you know how to play Earth Angel flawlessly, which by the way, is a super easy song to play spoken from a guitar player who is intermediate, not advanced. So we have seen a lot of the Dunning-Kruger effect um, in reality lately, especially with the COVID pandemic and suddenly everybody was an expert on viral diseases. Um, and so I think any field is prone to having their expertise challenged, but I think statisticians are particularly susceptible for a couple of reasons. Um, in, in, here, um, before I talk about those reasons, let me just kind of paint a picture of how things generally work. So there's only so many statisticians in the world. In an ideal world, every single stats class is going to be taught by a statistician. Hopefully a statistician that is a good teacher, which is rare to find, by the way. Somebody who is good with numbers and has personality. Very rare indeed. Also, and in an ideal world, all analyses would be conducted by a statistician. And then all analyses would be reviewed by statisticians. But the problem is there aren't that many statisticians out there. And to make up for that shortcoming, 
what we tend to do in science is we have non-experts teach stats classes and we have non-experts do stats analyses. And when these non-specialists end up teaching stats classes and doing their own analyses, they start to believe themselves to be experts because they're evaluating their ability to do the analyses that they're familiar with. And so the problem is after spending 20 years using the same four or five statistical analysis procedures, you begin to think of yourself as an expert when you're not. And I hope this doesn't come across as gatekeeping. I don't intend it to be gatekeeping. Um, it is, it's not like we statisticians have a secret that you have to get a PhD in in order to understand what that secret is. It just takes time to understand the field of statistics. Something that you can't get from just teaching intro stats classes. And I remember when I was uh, an undergrad, I was an ambitious undergrad. Totally not ambitious anymore. Totally lazy dude now. But anyway, when I was an undergraduate, I had a professor in my department who was kind of the resident statistician. And I was kind of frustrated with my um, stats training and I really wanted to like know everything that there was. And so I proposed a course to him. I even made a syllabus. That's how nerdy I was. And it showed what topics we would cover what week. And I remember at the time, I thought the most complex thing you could do is a meta-analysis. So that was the conclusion of it. Turns out meta-analyses are actually pretty easy. They're not the most complex procedure there is out there. But I had like every single procedure there was that I knew about. And I said, hey, what do you think of this course idea? And um, <laughs> his response was, I, I admire your enthusiasm. Um, but the thing is, is that you can't become a stats expert in a semester. You can't learn all these things in a semester. It takes years to really understand statistics. And at the time, I thought that was a little gatekeepy. I thought that was a little um, self-congratulatory of him to say, there's no way you're gonna be able to develop that so quickly. But in retrospect, um, he was totally right. I think he said 20 years. I don't know that it would take 20 years to get to that point, but uh, it does take a long time. So you might be asking why this is a problem. Okay, so people think they're better at stats than they really are, who cares? Let me just say, it's not just me getting my feelings hurt because people don't see me as the expert that I think I am. Maybe I am getting my feelings hurt a little bit. Um, but I like to think that I don't have that much of an ego. <laughs> uh, I think the problem is that so many people who are making the decisions about what good statistics look like are not actually experts. And that's where it becomes a problem because they're not qualified to make that judgment. And so those who train the next generation of researchers and the next generation of people who are doing their own analyses, if they're not qualified, they're just perpetuating all these problems that we've seen. And that's exactly what is happening right now. And this is why it is so frustrating and so hard to make changes because the majority of students are not taught by statisticians. And anytime somebody like me comes along and tries to rock the boat and tries to change things, there's all this inertia that prevents that from happening because there are so many stakeholders that don't deserve to be stakeholders. They do not have the expertise to be those sorts of stakeholders. And honestly, I am getting tired of fighting this fight. It feels like I have to fight it every day. Yeah, it's just frustrating being a statistician. Should have been a botanist. Nobody questions the expertise of a botanist. And so why am I making this video? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think, I guess I'm just asking for help. Maybe. Um, Because very often I feel like one guy who is fighting against this massive army to change things and it is daunting and I will inevitably fail because I can't do it alone. But I have this image in my mind of uh, the Berlin Wall that was this impenetrable wall 
for one person. One person couldn't knock it down. But it took thousands upon thousands of people, each chipping away little pieces of that wall to finally break it down. And I think that's what it requires. So I think for things to change for the better, that's what it requires is thousands upon thousands of people from across the world trying to tear down little chunks of that wall. So I guess what I'm asking is, will you help me push back? Wherever you're at, whatever your sphere of influence is, I hope that you are pushing back and you're trying to make a change away from the traditional way of doing statistics with significance tests and p-values and this very rigid way of doing things and more um, toward a more informative way of doing data analysis. And if you need more explanation about what uh, this approach is that I'm talking about, uh, I'll leave a link in the description. And I, I will say that um, this is my unique flavor of the approach, but I'm not certainly not the only one pushing towards these sort of changes. I certainly have nuances in my approach, but I, there's other people that are pushing for very similar changes. So at this point of the video, I would normally um, invite you to visit simplistics.net and take a class from me. Um, it feels kind of dirty to do that though. Um, for those of you who've been following for a long time, you know this about me that I hate um, ads <laughs> on YouTube. I'm an avid YouTube watcher um, and I hate ads so much so that I actually pay for YouTube premium and it kind of bothers me that I pay for it. But at the same time, I know what it's like to be a content creator and those people deserve to be compensated for all the effort they put into it. But I hate, I hate ads. Um, and I have been very hesitant to try to make money off of my channel for a long time. Um, because every time I watch a video where somebody says, this video is sponsored by blah, um, it, I don't believe them because they're being paid to say that. And to me, it's kind of a sellout sort of thing. And I'm worried that you'll think that I'm selling out because you don't know, if I'm trying to make money off of you, you don't know whether the words I'm speaking to you come as a passionate educator that I am, or if it's coming because I'm trying to make money off of you. Does that make sense? So let me just say right up front, you have no obligation whatsoever to support me financially through Simplistics or any other means. Actually, that's the only mean that that's the only way you could support me. You don't have to, because all my videos are online for free. And without ads. And my textbook is free. And I'll leave a link to that in the description. So I guess I feel a little bit better about that. <laughs> Everything that I do is free. If you want to pay for a more organized, um, customized experience, then I would welcome your donation, your purchase of a simplistics.net class. And if you choose to support me, I would really appreciate it. I think that's awesome. And I've mentioned in the past that we've, that I've got um, kind of at your own pace, on demand sort of classes where you have links to discussion boards and quizzes and it's all organized and all the content is organized into a Canvas course. And it's only $95, so that's pretty good. I hope at that price point, even graduate students can afford it. In addition to the on demand classes, I also have live classes. I have two live classes coming up. One of them starts in less than a week depending on when I get this video up. And I'm calling it office hours. And the idea behind office hours is it's kind of like a consultation, but it's as a group. So I'm limiting it to seven people. First come, first serve. And so uh, you show up. And if you want to bring a data set to share with me, I can analyze the data set with you. Or I could watch you analyze the data set. And I am there to answer whatever questions you have for two hours every week. And that's Monday from 4 to 6 Eastern Standard Time for the entire month of October. And the other live class that I'm doing is taking place in November at the same time, Mondays from 4 to 6 Eastern Standard Time. 
And that is my introduction to simplistics class, which is basically just an intro stats, but using my curriculum, which is way better than the old curriculum. That I'm confident about. But like I said, um, my videos, unless YouTube tricks me, and by the way, if you ever see an ad on my video, please let me know because they are not supposed to happen, but I haven't, I think I remember um, the default setting being changed by YouTube at one time, which really frustrated me. So if you ever have to watch an ad, please let me know and I will do my best to correct that if I can. So far, I believe YouTube allows me to not have any ads on my videos. Anyway, um, uh, if you do choose to visit simplistics.net, again, I really appreciate the donations. It helps me, um, <laughs> the biggest thing is it helps me stay motivated to make videos because if I'm making money making videos, actually, here's an interesting thing. Um, when I first started the YouTube channel, um, I had no ambitions of being a YouTuber. In fact, I think it's kind of embarrassing to be a YouTuber. I don't know why, but um, I just posted videos online for my students so that I didn't have to keep repeating the same lecture over and over again. It was fantastic. It was great. And then other people started liking it and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but I'm now at the point where I don't have to make videos anymore because all my curriculum videos are covered. But I want to keep making videos. So if you support me, that gives me the motivation to keep making videos. But anyway, I really do appreciate it if you decide to do so. Anyway, thank you for joining me and we'll see you next time. Peace out.